good morning, everybody. Um, and um, yes, I'm Sally Manuareva, and um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker today, John Honor Onstein, and to chair his session. Um, so, John is head of London and national programmes at the British Museum, and he's going to talk to us today about some of the challenges facing museums in the UK, but I also know that he's going to try and draw some parallels and some links through to the New Zealand context, and he's just been doing a little tour of New Zealand and visiting museums, so I think he's probably got a few learnings from that. Um, I can vouch for John's marvellous character and expertise, because I had the good fortune to work with John relatively recently on a joint project um, between the British Museum and the institution I worked for, which was the National Museums of Scotland. Uh, and we toured collections from our institutions around Scotland. It was one of my most favourite projects, and not just because we got the chance to visit lots of lovely Scottish places and pubs, but also uh, because it really demonstrated the power of collaboration between institutions. Um, and I think that's probably one of the things that John will touch on today, um, how those partnerships can help museums all the time, but particularly in challenging times. So um, without further ado, please can we give John a big Kiwi welcome and um, over to you, John. Thank you. Well, if you can vouch for my character, you don't know me that well. That's all I can say. Um, how are you feeling this morning? The lady in the green dress over there? Not so good. <laughs> um, I know some of you stayed up kind of late last night. I'm amazed to see so many of you here this morning. But that's kind of the point of these things, isn't it? It's not so much listening to speakers and things. Actually, it's about the interaction and meeting each other. Um, and most of all, I really believe it's about interacting at two in the morning after you've had more than a few glasses of wine. And that's when the best conversations happen. So um, I'm glad that some of you clearly did that. Um, well, I'm going to start. Oh, there I am. Don't I look relaxed? That's me on the edge of Lake Rotorua on, on part of my grand but very quick tour of New Zealand. Um, and I thought I would just start with one or two, um, one or two sort of tourist picks. This is, this is a story of my holiday, really. Actually, Sally had told me that she was going to, to start with a picture of, the, of, of me standing in the sea up in Shetland, which is at the northernmost point of the UK. And this was, I think, was January. So the northernmost point in the UK, and there I am with a couple of colleagues, one from the British Museum, one from the National Museum of Scotland, and we decided, foolishly, not to go swimming, that would have been too far, but to go paddling. So I thought I'd make a connection here with the, uh, with the slightly warmer water, and indeed I've experienced even warmer water with swimming in thermal pools and things, and what a treat that was. I really am just going to show you one or two holiday pics, first of all. <laughs> um, so. So um, this is, I'm sorry, this is a lame joke, but this is a geezer beside a geyser. Um, I'm very impressive it was too. I mean the geyser, not the geezer. Um, can, you, can you identify the museum? Canterbury. Canterbury. Um, whenever there's anything interactive in a museum, you have to get stuck in and have a bit of fun on your bike. Can you identify the museum, Sally? Auckland. And I think, I think this display is called something like Wild Child. Is that it? So I thought I have to be pictured as a wild child. Um, and jolly good it was too. Um, so I'm going to talk just for a few minutes, not just about the lovely time I've had in, in New Zealand. And actually, I should pause just to say a thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to come here to speak um, for all of the organization um, and the resource that's gone into that. And, and seriously, what an amazing country um, in terms of the landscape, in terms of the weather. I got up this morning, I thought, oh, it's like being in England. It was a little bit misty, but, um, but the sun's shining again. The sun has shone every, every day I've been here. Does that always happen? Yeah. Yes. Well, there you are. Um, so fantastic country, fantastic weather, um, great museums, and I visited quite a few of them over, over the last 10 days, and most importantly, warm and welcoming people. And I look out and I see all these smiling faces, and honestly, that has been just... Um, just uh, a little bit of what I felt in New Zealand, where really I have been welcomed quite formally and informally, and it's be, been a real treat. Um, but I'm going to speak for a few minutes about my perspective on the UK museum sector over the last 20 years, the good years and the, and, and the less good years, and, um, and just some thoughts about what's, 
that might mean going forward, where, you know, where we are now and um, what we have to do in slightly more difficult times to move forwards effectively. Um, but just to start with a memory from about 10 years ago at the British Museum, just over 10 years ago, one of my worst days at the museum. I've had some bad days as well as good ones, but this was one of the worst. And um, I got into the museum rather later than normal, and there were messages for me all over the place. My, there was a voicemail message saying, get in touch with security in the museum. Um, and there was a message on my desk in big capital letters, get in touch with security. And I thought, oh no, what's happened? Have they found me out or something? Um, and I went, to, um, I went to one of the galleries where I was directed, and there on the floor, in dozens and dozens of pieces was a beautiful 100,000-year-old hand axe. And it had been dropped and completely shattered, and actually irreparably shattered. We couldn't even find some of the pieces. Um, and this was part of the pilot of a handling program that I had championed at the British Museum. Um, I persuaded sometimes reluctant curators across the museum that actually engaging with objects in a, in a tactile, hands-on way was, was vitally important um, and that we should start to introduce that right across the galleries in the museum. And early on in the pilot, this is what happened. A volunteer, actually, who was, who was uh, managing the handling on a desk dropped the object, it was shattered, and, um, and there was a whole set of repercussions coming out of that. But I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. So... Um, you, most of your cows don't look like this at the moment. Years, years of plenty um, for UK museums. And they really have been extraordinary years the last 20 years, particularly because of investment from the Heritage Lottery Fund in the UK, um, introduced by a Conservative government and actually has had a transformative effect, particularly on the infrastructure of museums. Literally billions of pounds have gone into culture and arts in the UK. And most notably, as I say, into, into the infrastructure, into, um, into, into the buildings in the sector. Um, so it, it's the national museums and museums like my own, the British Museum, have been transformed. There was a particular surge of transformation of buildings in the year 2000 when, for example, Tate Modern uh, was built and the British Museum um, Great Court was opened. But actually, the impact has been right across the UK. So we've got the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge here. Um, we've got in the bottom right hand corner Shetland Museum, so we've just mentioned that and I'm making the point I suppose actually that it's some quite small, quite remote museums that have been transformed as well um, and uh, the current museum of the year in the UK, um, the Royal Albert Memorial Museum in Exeter again which has just just reopened after a major development, redevelopment so and, and that literally dozens and dozens of museums across the UK have been transformed in this way. It's been an, a totally unprecedented period of prosperity. Um, there, there, there's been a greater development of museums than there was in the great Victorian period when so many of those museums were built. The investment has been colossal. It's not just the redevelopment of museums, it's lots of new buildings as well. And three out of four of these are very, very recent, opened just in the last year or two. Um, top right hand corner is, is the Turner Contemporary in Margate for example there's the Riverside Museum in Glasgow bottom right, the tran new transport museum there, Museum of Liverpool that's opened in the last year and, and older, the Imperial War Museum North lots of these sort of iconic buildings, um, each one requiring tens of millions of pounds of investment and it's not just the infrastructure. Actually, museums have done very well in lots of other ways. Um, audiences have grown, and it depends which figures you look at, but over the last 10 years, audiences for museums have grown by at least 50%. Um, one in two people in the UK visits a museum at least once a year. And museums, my, my museum gets around 6 million visitors a year. Tate Modern gets 5 million visitors a year. Um, Kelvin Grove in Glasgow gets 2 or 3 million visitors a year. There are many, many museums attracting very significant audiences. And, and again, lots and lots of the smaller regional museums have also done very, very well in terms of, in terms of visitor numbers. There, were, there have been other changes as well, changing the focus for museums, in particular a focus on engaging a much more diverse audience. Um, and that has had some impact in terms of the people coming to museums, and also impact in terms of, in terms of processes and thinking. Um, and community participation and engagement is much more at the heart of museums in the UK now than it was 
um, 20 or 30 years ago, for example. I, I'm, I'm very involved with the Museums Association in the UK, and we, I, I looked at um, the results of a survey of our members that came in quite recently, and the thing that most struck me was the change in language when we talked about the role of museums. And people were talking again and again about community engagement, participation, bringing people together, um, even, even social justice, for example. So a completely different change in language in the sector over the last 20 years. And along with that, um, a, uh, a sort of growth in professional development across the sector, more and more professionalisation, the accreditation scheme across the UK working more and more effectively, and some really good training programmes across the UK. And actually, I'm part of one of those. I'm part of my funding to come here as, as part of something called the Claw Cultural Leadership Programme. So that's the, those are the good years. Um, I suppose one of my thoughts um, that I'll come on to a little bit more as I go along is that although they were good years and fantastic years in terms of development and, and, and the growth of the sector, um, maybe there's something in all of that growth and that prosperity that didn't encourage something we've talked a lot about over the last couple of days that I really wanted to, to pick up on, which is ideas and innovation. But I'll come back to that. Um, so, so good years and then the last three, three or four years not so good and actually really not so good. Um, I, I know things have been difficult for quite a lot of museums here and it's, it's certainly the case in the UK. This is um, the CUTS monitor, actually this is, this is a map of museums that have actually closed in the UK in the last two years and the MA, Museums Association in the UK is running a CUTS monitor across the UK looking at, at what's happening. Um, and you might be aware a number of local authorities have, have, have removed all funding for local arts and that's uh, having an enormous impact on, on some quite big museum services as, as well as some smaller ones. Um, about a quarter of museums in the UK have lost at least a quarter of their staff and about a third of museums have had to either close one of their sites or make a major reduction in the service they provide. So these are not, these are not small changes, they're really um, absolutely enormous. And, and actually there's worse to come. So on the 26th of June, National Museums will find out about their next funding settlements um, and it, it won't be an increase, of course, it, it will be a decrease and the question is just how significant that decrease is. Um, so really difficult times now but also interesting I think to reflect about one or, two, one or two other things happening across the sector. At this difficult time we in the UK I think have found it quite difficult to articulate um, what it is that we're all about, you know, what, what our core purpose is. I suspect part of that is because it's changed quite significantly in some ways over the last 20 years. If you'd asked somebody 30 years ago in a museum what are you about they'd probably have said well I'm about looking after these objects and putting them on display. Um, if you ask somebody now, they might talk about things like social justice or tolerance or bringing people together. As a sector, we haven't managed to have a coherent voice in the conversations we've had actually with local authorities and local government or with national government. So I think there's a little bit of confusion about what it is that we're all supposed to be doing. Um, I think something else, there's a, there's a uniformity in museums in the UK and probably here as well actually, I suspect. Um, uniformity sometimes in terms of the collections that are gathered and also in the way that we use them, um, the way that we explain them, the way that we display them and I suppose the most obvious point is that you know this print from the 1830s at the British Museum, well I know I work for a conservative national museum that's slow to change but really we don't look that different today. Um, and, and so there is that uniformity, not, that's not complete, you know, I'm not being silly about that, but I think on the whole, museums look like what you'd expect them to look like, and actually what our public expect them to look like. Um, and maybe a lack of debate as well. I go every year to the Museums Association Conference in the UK, and hundreds of other people from across the sector do as well. The thing that struck me every year about that is how little disagreement there is. How, I mean, it's partly because we're all nice to each other. I mean, you know, we are in the sector, aren't we? Um, but, you know, I, I, don't think that, I don't think there's that much debate. I don't think there's ma that much disagreement, and I'm not sure that's a very healthy thing. Um, so leadership, well we've, we've um, Roy's not even looking here and I've got a picture of him up. So, <laughs> the, um, so the, um, 
th there have been questions in the sector over a decade now about leadership and whether we have strong enough leadership. And therefore, a couple of very good uh, leadership programs were established about 10 years ago. I've already said I'm on one of those uh, um, at the moment. And around about 1,000 people have touched on those leadership programs in some way, either in terms of really big development programs or in terms of very, very small opportunities. Um, I suppose at the moment a point to make is, well, a, a couple of points to make. One is that actually some of our key leaders, people like Neil McGregor at the British Museum or Nick Sorota at Tate, um, won't be around for very much longer. So there will be some sort of change in turnover in terms of leadership. And also, I'm only making this point because of where we are, we keep losing some of our best leaders. And where are they going? They're coming to New Zealand and Australia most of the time, as far as I can see. Um, and why would they do that? So this is just a photo just off, um, off the coast of, of Christchurch, where I was a week ago. I can't imagine why anybody want to be, would want to be part of this. There you are. So um, I suppose coming back to that idea that maybe... Um, We've had good years, we have more challenging years now, but one of my interests is that maybe, um, I don't know, are we the most innovative sector? Are, are, we, um, are we as good at encouraging new ideas and, and change as we should be? I wonder, if, um, I wonder if there's something that goes on around collections, and not all of us have collections, but most of us have collections to look after. I was talking to a director of a national museum in the UK a few weeks ago, and um, we were talking about the cuts, and he said, oh, well, at the end of the day, we've got to focus on the most important thing, which is caring for our collections. And I sort of buy that, and I, and I sort of don't, because I think if that's your first, if that's your gut instinct, to fall back on conserving something, preserving something, maybe there's something in that, maybe there's something even in the type of people who are attracted to do that, that isn't so much about innovation and change and ideas. And I'm not talking about you guys here, but, um, but certainly looking across the UK, that, that's just one of my thoughts. I think at the moment, though, there's some really good stuff happening in the UK museums. I think there is quite a lot of creativity, and I think that creativity and innovation um, is partly coming out of the challenge that's being presented at the moment of, of having very little resource and having to make cuts left, right and centre. I also think that most of that innovation isn't coming out of the national museums. Um, I think it's coming out of much smaller museums. I don't think necessarily it's coming from senior leaders in the sector. Um, I think, and you know, maybe you wouldn't expect that, but I think some of the interesting work is coming out of people who haven't been in the sector for quite as long and very often are younger. So let me give you just three or four examples of some things that I think are really interesting. There are lots of new models or changing models for running museums, partly forced by the, by the economic situation. Um, so, so the big change, I suppose, is a move to trust status. So local authorities moving away from um, control of, of, of local governments to become independent trusts. And normally that has been at least partly forced by the financial situation. So the, there's a downside to that, there's a challenge to it, but there's also, um, there's also a real opportunity. So I was talking to a colleague who was saying to me recently, you know, for the first time we can have the website that we want to have. We don't have to rely on the council website. For the first time they could be more entrepreneurial in terms of how they were going out and, and, and looking to make money. And around about 30 um, regional museums have moved to trust status just in the last few years, and there are lots. Some have decided not to, but there are quite a, quite a few others who are, who are looking at that. So quite a, quite a big change. And some who are even going a bit further. Um, so there's a guy called Mike Benson. He leads, um, he leads a, a museum and heritage site called Beads World up in, in Newcastle in the northeast of the country. And he's in a difficult situation because he, he's been well funded by the local council. Um, Tyne and Weir museums would say he's been too well funded by the local council over the last few years. But he's, that's not going to be the case going forward and that's, he's been told that by the council. So he's, he's exploring other models for how his museum might operate and might be in the future. Um, and he's looking for example at what it would mean to look at some sort of a cooperative model, actually um, calling on a 19th century cooperative model, and looking at what it would mean for the community around the museums to invest in different ways in that museum, and then to get some sort of social return coming out of, of what happens. Um, actually, his ideas are quite vague. He's just getting going on this. Is it going to work? I don't really know. But, um, but I like the fact that he's trying something just a little bit different from what the museums around him are doing. Um, another small museum, this is Wardown Park in Luton, about 40 miles north of 
of London and just the same situation in that the director of the um, museum trust there um, has been told that at the moment she has a sort of negotiated settlement with the council. She's been told that in two years there will be no funding from the council that goes towards um, this particular site, Wardown Park. So again, she's having to think really creatively about what does she do? Does she just, do they close? Do they hand it over completely to volunteers? And she's looking at a model that's somewhere in between those two where um, there's a sort of social enterprise model where she's involving lots of different community organisations in different ways in the running of, of the museum. So different organisations in running tours in the museum, um, a, a, a college for adults with learning difficulties are running the cafe in the museum, for example. So just looking at different sorts of investment, different sorts of, of community ownership in a way. So interesting things happening in terms of how, how museums are run. And also some interesting conversations happening about sustainability um, and, and the, again the role of museums in society. This is a guy called to Tony Butler. He's making quite big waves actually. He, he, he runs a small museum, the Museum of East Anglian Life on the edge of a, of a country town, quite a small country town, Stowe Market. But he's running this thing called the Happy Museum. I mean I just love the title. Um, and he, it's a creative inquiry to reimagine the purpose of museums. So again, he's thinking about what the role of museums could be in society. He's thinking about their contribution to well-being. Um, and he's thinking about how museums can place as, at least as much emphasis on what the future looks like as what the past looks like. Again, and, and he's working with lots of other museums in that. I don't know, it's a creative inquiry. I don't know quite where it's going to go, but I like the process. I like the conversations that are happening. So lots of different efforts to share across the UK at the moment. And, some of the, and a lot of these are sort of bottom up. They're not things that national museums or the Department for Cultural Media or Sports are suggesting. They're things that are coming out of different, different parts of the UK. And the classic example is this thing, the, this is a logo, something called the Share Scheme um, in the east of England. I think it's an amazing scheme, actually. And the, the idea is incredibly simple. It's just that all of the museums in the east of England um, agree to invest some resource into a sort of central pot of resources. Um, a, a few of them, the, some of the larger museums put a bit of money in, not very much money, but what most of them put in is, is time and expertise. And some of them also put in practical resources, conservation resources, use of a freezer, um, use of a meeting room, whatever it happens to be. And then they look at how to redistribute these resources. And most notably what that means is a fantastic training program. And if you look on the website of the Share Scheme, um, it never seems to be planned very far in advance, but it, it, in any particular week you look at, there are, there are three or four training events going on that are completely free, that are put together at um, you know, very little cost. I've been to one or two of them, the quality is good, and it's just a very simple model that they're all putting energy into something. They're all putting what they can contribute into, into a wider pool of resource that's, that's shared out. Um, what are two national museums? Uh, I mean, we contribute to that scheme as well, for example. There's another similar scheme starting in London at the moment and conversations about similar things happening in other parts of the country. And federations are growing in the UK, um, particularly smaller museums working together and federations that are led often by fairly junior staff in museums and the membership tends to be fairly junior staff in museums but looking at other forms of collaboration and sharing. Really good thing, I think. Um, and also some conversations about the big preoccupation of the sector over the last two, 20 years around participation and, and community engagement. That's not a very good slide, is it? Um, and most notably the work of somebody called Bernadette Lynch, who actually drew on what's, happened at, what's been happening in the last um, decade and a half at Tapapa. And her suggestion is very strongly that all of the resource that's gone into community engagement and participation work over the last 10 or 20 years hasn't had quite the impact that we wanted it to have. We've set up some very good programs, but that, the, the readiness of that external, the readiness of the availability of that external resource has tended to push those programs to the edge of organizations rather than placing them at the heart of the organization. So her argument is that all of that extra money really hasn't helped the core purpose of some of those museums. Um, and so they're running, again, a sort of collaborative inquiry across a number of different museums, including national museums, but more, more particularly regional and local museums, looking at what it would mean to put participation much closer to the heart of museums in terms of sharing power, sharing ownership. Maybe some things that are a bit closer to what, what some of the museums in New Zealand have already done. Um, so I think really interesting things happening and different ways of thinking in the sector. And 
I don't want to make a facile point here, and sort of apologies if it comes across that way, but just the point that struck me when I was in Christchurch is just that actually the difficult times there have, uh, have created a really sort of productive envir environment in a sense for museums. Museums are working collaboratively. They're sharing storage space. They're actually sharing exhibition space as well. You know, when was the last time that happened? And maybe they're giving up a little bit of control to each other. I don't know. And there's some really creative programming happening off-site because it can't be happening on-site. So, as I said, I don't want to make too simple a point, but, but um, it's just interesting that I think when times are difficult, when there isn't as much resource, sometimes it pushes us a little bit harder to be a bit more creative and to come back to that thing that we talked about for two, two ideas, which is ideas and how to make good ideas happen. Just to look at an example of an organisation, a museum in the UK, that I think is good at having ideas and, and, and making them happen. Um, this is Manchester Museum. So Manchester's in the northwest of England. It's a very long established university museum. Um, if there's a museum that I could be director of, I think I'd like to be director of Manchester Museum because I, I've got a real soft spot for it. I think they've got great collections. Um, and they've done some really interesting things. Actually, they've done some things that people at the British Museum have struggled with. Um, we think they're a bit rebellious, um, a little bit difficult just for the sake of it. I love that. I think it's fantastic. I, they're, they're my favourite partner museum because they push us all the time in how we work with them. So, for example, they've looked at human remains and, and how human remains are exhibited, and in particular at Egyptian mummies, and they have a strong collection of Egyptian mummies. So, and they've done a process of testing with their public, looking at what it would mean to cover mummies, to expose mummies to different degrees. Um, and actually, they haven't changed in the end how they're displaying uh, mummies in their new galleries. But it was interesting to go through that sort of process of questioning uh, and inquiry. Um, they ran a really interesting pro project. The, uh, the guy on the right is, is, is an artist who, who was a hermit for 40 days and 40 nights. And he lived at the top of a tower in the Manchester Museum with no human contact for that period. I presume he had toilets and food and drink and those things, but he had no human contact. He just had some objects. And his task as an artist was to engage with those objects for 40 days and 40 nights and blog about them and talk about them and, 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 and discuss the relevance or the importance and the meaning that he um, associated with those objects. Quite a different sort of process for a museum. I think at one point there was an idea that he would select one of those objects to destroy at the end of his time. Um, it didn't happen, uh, which was interesting. But um, so, so interesting creative thinking. Their displays are creative, particularly the new, particularly the newer displays. Um, and there we are again. Um, and um, th there's a real mixture of, of, of the old and new in the displays of collections um, from, uh, of objects from different parts of the collection. They have a fantastic collection that varies from. Um, botanical specimens to fossils to archaeology and social history and so on. And they've done quite a lot of mixing, mixing that up in different ways, which I think is great. Um, they've also changed their structure. They've changed how they're, they're run. Um, and notably, they've combined a lot of their services with the Whitworth Art Gallery in Manchester. Um, and also now, actually, with the Manchester Art Gallery. And, and there really is a process of giving up power here because they've combined a lot of services, a lot of um, back-of-house services and some front-of-house services as well. So they have uh, one learning team that operates across the institutions. They have one marketing team, for example, and one you know, finance team and so on. That's quite a big step for museums. Actually, the Whitworth and the Manchester Museum are both part of the university, but now the art gallery as well. Um, museums aren't used to, to operating in that sort of way. I'm completely reliant on my slides to know what to say next, so I'm just going to... Oh, it's still there. Oh, it's just not on my screen. My screen's gone, so that, that means I've got to look slightly backwards here. Okay, I've got the art gallery again. That's, that's fine. You haven't. Are you going to catch up? You're not moving. I've gone blank. Oh, I've gone back to the same picture. This is quite exciting, actually. OK, good. Um, so um, I love AV people. I think you're great. I was just talking to the AV guys before, and I was just saying they're the coolest, calmest people in the world, because something always goes slightly wrong, doesn't it? And there's no point in flapping up there. You just have to make it work. So thank you very much indeed. Um, 
So what, what has created that sort of environment that allows Manchester Museum to be a little bit quickly, a little bit edgy, a little bit innovative? Um, the first thing, and most obviously, is just they've got a leader who is that way inclined. Nick Merriman is a director there. He, he comes from um, a background of museum studies, and he, he loves, uh, you know, he, he he loves innovation, he, he, he likes change, and um, he was always going to push the organisation in that sort of direction. So, so leaders who are happy with innovation and, and new ideas. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. That's, that, I've jumped on too, too soon. I thought we were going wrong again. Never mind. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to Grace and Perry in a second. Um, this is not the leader of Manchester Museum. This is... <laughs> this is <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> who knows what he does in his spare time? I, I don't. Um, but no, this is this is Nick Merriman again. Um, what else, though? I mean, he's part of a university museum, and there's something there. What are universities about? They're about testing ideas. They're about trying things out. They're about having a go. Um, and I think the most productive environment, probably in the UK, and may, I don't know whether it's the case here for for ideas and innovation in museums is those university museums. There's some really interesting things happening in other places like University College London um, in, in, uh, in London uh, as well. So there's that sort of environment that encourages and fosters innovation. Um, there's also, I suppose, the environment, the fact that actually they, universities are being cut in the way other, other in public institutions are, um, and so they've had to make cuts. So, so there's a sort of necessity thing there going on there. And there's one other rather nice bit to this, and this, this sort of explains the, the happiness to give up a little bit of power, which is that I don't know whether you know these institutions, but Nick Merriman is actually married to the director of the Whitworth and the Manchester Art Gallery. Um, actually, that's just to be clear, that's one person, the director of the <laughs> Manchester Museum and the Art Gallery. It's not, a, it's not more collaborative than that, as far as I know. Um, so... so um, I just find, I think that's a really interesting dynamic because what it's meant is that there isn't the same degree of territoriality. I don't think that would have happened if they had been independent directors, as far as I as far as I can see. The fact that they they're sharing all sorts of things um, just made it a little bit easier to think about shared services for the museum. So, is there a lesson there for us? <laughs> Who knows? Um, and just to say, I, I just wanted to reflect for one minute, really, on one or two sort of interesting things at the British Museum, because I, I do think, on the whole, national museums um, have less opportunity to be um, to, to, to take risks. There are certain expectations of them. Not always the case, but um, but it, it can it can often be the case. Um, just to say, you know, there are, of course, really interesting things that happen happen in national museums. I loved the Grayson Perry exhibition that we did at the BM um, a year or two ago. For us, it was a bit of a risk because it's about doing something a bit more playful, a bit more creative than normal. Um, and Grayson came and spent almost two years coming in and out of the museum with curators. He really got to know his stuff. He found some weird and wonderful objects in the collection that inspired him. And he put those together and he created some of his own work in response to those. Um, it struck me, I went into, I go into every, we have community previews of every exhibition we have at the British Museum where we invite in all of our community partners to come free of charge and, and um, come and see the exhibition before anybody else does. Um, and going into the community preview of Grace and Perry was extraordinary because it, it was so lively. People were talking and laughing. There was discussion of a sort, there was a liveliness that you don't normally see in a British Museum exhibition maybe. So I, I liked that. And it only happened because there was a little element of, of risk in the exhibition. Um, even more recently, a Hajj exhibition, exhibition on Muslim pilgrimage at the British Museum. I don't know whether that sounds a risky thing to do. It was a really risky thing for us to do, actually, and particularly because what it meant was that we had to collaborate very closely with the Saudi Arabian government, and that was an entirely uncomfortable thing to do at times. What it meant was that the exhibition that resulted was not the exhibition the British Museum would have put on independently, and we were criticised um, for that, quite understandably, it only told one part of the uh, of the story of Hajj. Um, but nevertheless, I think it was a good thing to do, um, and I think it was a good thing to do because it attracted a fantastic audience. 50% um, of the audience was Muslim, but of course there was a there was a much wider, more diverse audience as well. And also, just because the amount of co uh, of debate and to some extent criticism, which I think was a very healthy thing indeed. And sometimes using objects in really difficult ways. So this is an object called the Cyrus Cylinder. Um, arguably, it's the first declaration of human rights that's known. Um, and 
the, at, at a point where the British government has, has virtually no polit political relationship with Iran, um, the, the museums nevertheless are working collaboratively and this object was lent to Tehran. And that was a very difficult conversation um, to have with, uh, with D DCMS, uh, Department of Culture, Media and Sports in the UK and with other parts of, of government at times. It wasn't something that was entirely approved of and certainly there was a risk there. But, but the end result, and people were worried it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be returned. It, it was returned, of course. Um, and the end result was that one million people in Tehran came to see that single object, filed through the museum in long queues to see that object. So it was a quite extraordinary thing. Sometimes museums can reach places that, that, that others can't, the governments can't. So coming towards a close, just some, some thoughts then really about um, what that might mean in the UK and maybe some of this is relevant um, in, in, in New Zealand and other parts of the world as well. So, so one of my points was that I think there's quite a uniformity in museums. I think, uh, I mean, my little observation of, of the bits of New Zealand I, I've seen are that there's quite a uniformity in, in, in quite a lot of the, the museums here too. That doesn't mean they're not fantastic and doing great jobs, but just that just to make the point that I think we need to be comfortable with the fact that museums can have very different purposes. Even museums with the same collections um, can have almost entirely different purposes. And so something we talked about a bit yesterday was the idea of understanding clearly what your purpose was and then aligning your organization and your resource behind that. So I think being comfortable with the fact that we're not all trying to do the same thing. You could have two museums in neighboring towns with similar collections and actually decide you want to do something quite different. And then to get behind whatever that thing is. So if, if you want to be um, a family destination, then that means being immersive and it means being completely engaging and it means thinking about what your admission fees are that, that allow families to come and so on and having a nice picnic area and, and all of those things. If, you're, if actually your core purpose is to be, it is around social justice maybe and maybe it's, it's around tolerance and bringing people together and making difficult conversations possible, then you've got to structure your museum, haven't you, to, to, to encourage that, to allow that. You've got to have um, points, uh, you've got to have provocations, you've got to have people who will act as mediators in the conversations, you've got to have ways of bringing people together. Maybe you've got to bring some of your community participation programs much more to the heart of what you do as a museum and make them much more what you're about. Maybe you've got to look at, um, at entry level roles in your museum and how, pe how a diverse workforce comes into your, into your own workforce. Um, investing in people. It's interesting that in the UK we are cutting our investment in our museum workforce very significantly at the moment. The Museums Association made a decision about a year ago to stop its training programme because it was losing money. Um, and that was quite a significant source of training for the sector. Uh, I mentioned two leadership programmes established in the sector. One of them, um, one of them stopped a, a year or two ago. Uh, the main diversity programme, workforce diversity in the programme has has stopped in the last year or so. So there's actually a significant reduction, I think, in, in the resource going on, it, going into the workforce at the moment. I was involved in doing a, um, a, a survey of mu across mu the museum workforce quite recently about what people needed in terms of development, in terms of expertise and so on. And not surprisingly, there was an enormous demand, still an enormous need. But actually, the thing that I found most interesting was that people were thinking a bit differently about their own needs and thinking a bit less about formal training, which is quite an expensive model and requires you to, you know, travel to the other side of the country or to London or whatever it happens to be. But we're thinking more about local networks. Um, we're thinking more about things like um, mentoring, coaching, action learning sets, other ways of sharing their expertise and, and supporting each other. Um, but those things still take resource. So I, so I suppose just the thought that um, whether we're a national museum, whether we are um, a museum's association, or whether we're a, a regional or local museum, we've got to be investing significantly in the development of our workforce. Um, partnerships and collaborative leadership, was, well, Sally was right, that's sort of second nature to me because it's what I do in my work in terms of community partnerships, in terms of national partnerships across the UK. But I think, um, I think we're seeing some really interesting partnerships growing up in, in the UK museum sector at the moment. I mentioned Manchester just as, as one example. But I think the key with partnership is real partnership means giving up power. And if you're not prepared to give up power, then I suspect it's not really a partnership. 
as national museums, um, I'm conscious of the fact we have people from national museums here, but I think as national museums we find that particularly difficult. I'm speaking about my own museum, the British Museum. We're fine when we're working with Shetland because they're nice and small. Um, working with Tate or the VNA, we find that quite difficult in terms of real collaboration actually. Um, so I think there's a challenge there to go for partnerships, collaborate with leadership and to, and to be real about that, um, to give up some of our power. I love, I love objects in museums, I love collections, I used to be a curator, maybe a bit of me still is a curator, I don't know, um, but I wonder if sometimes we hold on just a bit too hard to our wonderful objects in terms of, in terms of the opportunity for creativity and doing some interesting things. I had, it, having had a couple of glasses of wine last night, as I walked home, much earlier than most of you because I was mindful that I had to be here this morning. Um, as I walked home, I had a thought, which is that if, if at the British Museum we decided to use our collections in a different way, imagine if we decided to use them to destruction. Now, actually, of course, we're all using our collections to destruction ultimately. But imagine if we decided to be a bit more radical and use them a lot more in object handling, sending them all over the place to the point where we knew objects would, would be destroyed at a fair old rate. Imagine if we lost a thousand a year. A thousand a year, wouldn't that be a terrible thing? What would the newspapers think? We'd only have the collections to last another 8,000 years. <laughs> I mean, it's not bad, is it, actually? And I know you can't quite think about collections in that way. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of half being flippant and stupid. But, um, but sometimes, I just think sometimes that, that, that inclination to protect things gets in our way of being, being really creative. As a national museum in the UK, we have a, a, something called a national indemnity, indemnity scheme, a, a government insurance scheme. It's a, real, um, it's, a, it's a great thing in some ways, but it's a real problem because it puts a real high level of requirement of security around any of our loans, and, and, and that's problematic when we, want to, when we want a distributed national collection. We have a, a collection of 8 million objects at the British Museum. In my mind, and that's not quite right actually um, and we're working really hard in terms of long-term loans in particular to get that collection out but it's more difficult than it should be um, and that thing about taking some some long shots I can't remember who it was yesterday somebody said something about the fact that um, the ideas were at least as important as collection as objects as collections um, imagine if we back that up with our resource imagine if we put as much resource into having new ideas um, supporting the people who have them, you know, fostering that environment, piloting those ideas as we put into caring for our collections. Or imagine if we didn't do that. Imagine if we only put 10% of our resource or 5% of our resource specifically into that. So many organisations and companies in the world do that very deliberately. They take long shots in, um, that they, they invest in new technology, they invest in new ideas, they might decide that 80% of their resources, and this is financial um, investments as well, you might decide that you play it safe with 80% of what you're doing, uh, but 20% you take some long shots and that's in the end where you really make your money or, or, or where you make some sort of progress. So I think in the museum sector in the UK and maybe in other places as well, we've got to be better at investing in some of those long shots. And, and I just emphasise the point that I think a lot of those long shots um, don't... Um, that, that you, you don't see them in the obvious places. I think you've got to look a little bit hard. I think you've got to look to the institutions that you might not expect and to people that you, you might not expect that from. So just, just to show we, we're sort of putting our money where our mouth is, or I, I am, um, this is a programme that, um, that we launched at the British Museum a, a couple of months ago, and it's called Fresh Leads, and it's just all about finding the right people with the right ideas and trying to support them in, in realising those. I'm showing you rather lamely a blog from somebody at the Museums Association um, uh, about it, uh, simply because there's nothing, there's nothing, pub, there's no public documentation about this at the moment. We're just trying it out. But the idea is very simple: that we're investing. We, we've recruited 12 people from right across the UK museum sector. Um, and some of them, a couple are museum directors, and so, you know, they're the people you might expect, therefore. Um, most of them aren't. Lots of them are in the middle of organisations, and there are a couple who have literally only been in the sector for about a year. One of them is working, two of, two of, the, two of the 12 are from the British Museum, and one of them has been working in the front of house team on the information desk just for a year. Um, but already, we were noticing in the British Museum the impact she was having on the people around her, and some of her ideas, which were really positive about how to connect front of house staff at the British Museum with other parts of the museum. So, so what we try to do is find 12 people, most of whom aren't obvious, 
all of whom have got a positive idea about change in their own organisation or in the wider sector. And we're looking at what it means, what happens when we connect them together, because connecting creative people is always a productive thing to do, particularly where some of them are more experienced, some of them are less experienced, and they get different things from each other. And then we're looking at what sort of support they need. So they, are, they do have action learning sets, they have mentoring, um, they have coaching. Um, and we're, we're looking at how we can connect them to other resources, we're looking at how we can connect them to different partners within the museum sector or actually outside the museum sector as well. So ultimately what we're looking at is can we support those 12 individuals in achieving the things that they want to achieve um, for the benefit of themselves, for the benefit of their organisations and for the benefit of the wider sector. I haven't really had to, nobody has asked me very much about this at the British Museum, so I haven't had to explain why it is that we're doing this, um, because in a sense this is, isn't really our job, but I, I'm pretty convinced that ultimately this is not only going to benefit the sector, it's going to benefit the British Museum as well, and there's going to be some really creative ideas there that feed back into what we're doing at the museum and particularly into our partnership work. So just, just finishing. Um, that hand axe that fell to the floor, uh, just to make a, a simple point about that. Um, so it sent me into a panic, um, and I went to see the deputy director of the, the, the British Museum, and uh, he's just retired actually, he's a great guy called Andrew Burnett. Um, and he said, relax, he said it's okay, he said we, this will have to, we're going to have to talk to the trustees of the museum about this, but it's okay, I'll, you know, I, I will manage that conversation and, um, and as far as I can I'll you know, support you and, and support the programme in that. And, and he did, and um, although there were some questions or some difficult moments, um, but we, we continued with, with the programme. And I checked the figures a couple of days ago and that programme has enabled 1.7 million people to handle objects. So at, at, at the moment, about 160,000 people a year are handling objects through that programme in different galleries in the museum. And I think that's had a wider impact on the museum, actually, in terms of thinking about how objects can be used and the relationship with audiences. So I, I suppose my question is, um, what, what would you do if one of your staff made a, made a mistake like that, if there was a bit of a disaster? And, and my final thought would just be for all of us to sort of create the types of environments that foster people in taking risks, people in making mistakes, and people in making positive change in our sector. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Lots of avenues for discussion, um, leadership, models of working, innovation, grassroots ideas, adaptation. We've got a few moments for questions and comments, um, and we've got some roving mics. Um, if you could introduce yourself and just uh, yeah, say where you're from, that would be really helpful. Okay. Hello, um, Eric Dorfman, Whanganui Regional Museum. Uh, thank you for a, a very, very interesting talk, and it's... Uh, I'm glad I curtailed the drinking so I could get here in good, good spirits. Um, the, the thing that struck me is, um, it seems to be a truism that when times get tough, people get more creative. Obviously, uh, well, one hopes that it swings in roundabouts and then eventually times will get good again. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on how to embed this creativity, this lean thinking, so that it carries us through when times are good again and we come out the other end with something sustainable. Um, no, I, I don't think I can answer that, to be honest, but just, just that, um, you know, mate, the sector has changed very significantly over the last 20 years. I talked about that workforce survey. Um, and the language had changed, the environment had changed. And so I, I, think, um, I think this environment is going to change us and it's going to change us for the, you know, if we have another five years that are difficult, and we, we will at least, um, I, I think those five years probably will, 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 will set us in a better position for the, for the years that follow. Um, and, you know, there will be some different ways of being, some different ways of operating that come out of that. But also, it's just down to individual leaders, isn't it, I think? Um, so, so maybe, I mean, I, I, think, um, I think digital is changing fundamentally the way that we all think it's changing the world entirely. And as museums, of course, we haven't quite caught up with that. How, how can we? Um, 
And I, I, I think that sort of greater democratisation that digital is bringing is, bringing is going to push us in some of the directions of some of those changes in, in the UK anyway. But a, a lot of that is bottom up. It's about sharing. It's about um, partnership. It's about hearing from each other. It's about uh, um, yeah. It, it's about a distributed model of authority to some extent, I guess. And, and I know we need different types of leadership, but I think there are things that are happening in in, in, in the wider world that the uh, particular environment at the moment, with with some of the challenges, is going to is going to focus. And I think that will probably put us in a better position as we move forward. Um, I mean, I think I think the real responsibility for national museums here. Um, I know that's a slightly top-down thing, but I, but I think national museums are, are national museums and need to take that responsibility seriously. Um, for museums associations and, and so on, I think um, it's easy, I mean, a, a, a simple example is it's easy to convict, continue to do training of the sort that we've done for the last 10 or 20 or 30 years. And, 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 and the, my really clear understanding in the UK is that that isn't what most museum professionals are valuing at the moment. Um, and so I think that therefore there is a responsibility on some of those cross-sector organisations and national museums to think about our own models of operation as well. So that's a kind of institutional leadership. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Eric. Other questions? Ah, anyone here? Yeah, John Asdale, Thames uh, School of Mines. So how many hand axes has the British Museum got? <laughs> <laughs> One less. <laughs> I don't know, and, and um, of course the answer is we've got quite a lot of we've got quite a lot of hand axes. Uh, we've got many many hand axes. Um, it doesn't mean I'm not sure quite where the question is coming from because it doesn't mean that I, you know I don't regret the loss of that one, which I do sincerely. But um, actually, as long as you don't literally drop them on the floor, hand hand axes are pretty robust, of course, and and they are hand axes. You know, they're made to be handled. My, my background is in numismatics. Coins are never meant to be looked at behind glass. They're meant, and actually they're boring behind glass. They're meant to be held in your hand. And actually then, with a bit of explanation, they come to life. <laughs> well, I might just ask a question while people are pondering. Um, John, it's a slightly tongue-in-cheek question, but you talked about how um, people in the museum sector are sometimes a bit quite nice to each other. So, uh, which I think is really something to be valued. Um, however, do you think more competition amongst museums would aid the sector in times of constraint? Gosh, that's a really, because I've been arguing for collaboration and partnership and you're, you're pushing in a different direction there. So that's, that's a good question. Um, I think the answer is yes, because mm -hmm. I think that some of the most interesting work in the UK is happening in the independent sector. Uh, we've got about a thousand independent museums. We have a fantastically, no, actually more, a bit more than that. Um, we have a fantastically strong organisation called the Association of Independent Museums um, doing great work. And <laughs> I think sometimes those independent museums look at us in our national museums and local authority museums and just laugh at us and laugh at the, some of the sort of conversations we have and you know, the way we run round and round in circles and talk about social justice and community participation and that sort of thing, because they have a different sort of reality, which is making sure that um, there are enough bums on seats and people are buying the coffee in the cafe and all of those things, and that people have a really good day out when they visit. Um, and I think, um, I think those are maybe the most important things anyway. Sometimes, I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm absolutely an advocate for museums being centres of um, tolerance and bringing people together and so on, but sometimes I think in museums we don't talk enough about having a a good time and having fun and that sort of thing. Um, so, so yeah, I think there's really interesting things happening in um, independent museums. Incidentally, they're doing much better than, at the moment than, than others are because, of course, they're not facing the same sort of cuts. And that goes right to the top. So, Historic Royal Palaces runs five palaces um, in in um, in the UK. Places like Hampton Court and Kensington Palace and the Tower of London doing fantastically well at the moment. They're expanding their operations in in various different directions. Um, and it's partly because of their indep independence, it's partly because of the entrepreneurial nature of the organisation. And actually, I think they attract probably a more entrepreneurial staff to what they're doing. They, they have to. Mm -hmm. 